For a long time, Africa has been held back by the borders that were drawn up during the Berlin Conference. These borders hinder movement of people, hinder movement of goods, and draw back trade. And now African speakers and African scholars are beginning to come up and tell Africans that borders are artificial lines that do not necessarily exist. If you're in Europe and you have a European pass, you can travel from one country to the other and the other without any restrictions, yet we are the ones that enforce these restrictions on the continent years and years and years after colonialism. And Africans are saying it's time to do away with this. And by the way, you compare yourself with Europeans. Europeans were never colonized and given artificial boundaries. So how dare you stick your head above your hind legs and compare the AU and the EU? The boundaries, the borders in Africa are not ours. Germany for the Germans, Britain for the British, French for the French, and so on. And they're coming to get the, out of their own volition. We have artificial boundaries where people were there are Swazi people here, Swazi that side, Debele people said. So in Africa, we don't have a choice, by the way, unlike the Europeans, because those boundaries are meaningless. And in any case, it's a survival issue. We will not survive under globalization as small little countries. So yes, there are challenges, but it's not utopia. Let's work hard. Let's make it happen. Let's make SADAC work, COMESA, the EAC, Maghrib, ECOWAS, those blocks must function and the AU must work. Hello there, how are you doing? Welcome again to another episode of our conversations. My name is Indira Ganga. I'm a business journalist by profession and a digital content creator and I enjoy creating content on Africa, Black people, empowerment and how we can take our rightful place at the global stage. Today I want us to discuss a lecture that was given by uh, one of a South African speaker during an event and he raised like very crucial points. Um, we live in a modern day and age where people have to move, goods have to move, and there's a lot of conversation about just ensuring that we can easily crisscross across the continent with ease. There are also questions being raised about the quality and the caliber of leaders that we have on the continent. And that was the first thing that the speaker spoke about. Um, if you look back to the time that... Um, African countries were fighting and got independence. The caliber and the quality of leaders that we have during that time was very different from the leaders that we have now. If you look at leaders like Nelson Mandela, if you look at um, Kwame Nkrumah, if you look at Malimu Julius Nyerere, if you look at um, leaders like Thomas Sankara, the, the leaders that were there 10, 20, 30 years ago were higher quality and higher caliber leaders than the leaders that we have now. They were leaders that did not necessarily believe in power as an individualistic um, facet, but power as a collective tool to help Africans on the continent become better. Um, um, if you look at Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah was a Pan-Africanist at heart. He believed that the independence of Ghana, which was among the first African countries to get independence, means nothing if the rest of the continent is not united. You know, if you look at Nelson Mandela and the and the selfless fight towards bringing down the apartheid system and ensuring that there's fairness and equality in a country like South Africa, these are leaders that stood for something. They really stood for something. And then now we just have a crop of leaders that are so drunk and infatuated by power. And when they get into power, all they can think about is amassing as much money and fortifying that world and have little to no regard for the people that they serve and the greater continent good. And that's what the speaker was calling out. People, there's no leader in Africa right now who's the caliber of Gaddafi or caliber of Kwame Nkrumah. We have midgets running around as leaders, intellectually, I mean. No one, Mbeki was almost there, but not really. Kwame Krumah, Ben Bela. What did Kwame Krumah say? We as Ghanaians are prepared to surrender our sovereignty in part or in total in pursuit of African unity. The independence of Ghana is meaningless unless it is linked to the independence of the rest of the African continent. Ben Bela, what did he say? Let us die a little so that Rhodesia can be free. Let us die a little so that South Africa can be free. These were visionaries. So what I'm emphasizing is that their vision was way ahead of his time. You know, there was a big debate between Krumah and Nyerere in 63. Krumah was saying, guys, 
let's move very quickly and unite and be one block. If you get used to being a president, you will not relinquish office. Let's move quickly before you become too comfortable in your little palace as a president. And Yerewa was saying, no, 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 let's do it brick by brick, gradually, slowly, and then we'll get there. And Yerewa won the debate. But guess what? We lost the African integration. Because everyone now wants to be president. They will never give up. Krumah, Gaddafi were ready to surrender individual presidency for the collective African presidency. So, yes, they made their own mistakes, but the vision of integration was there. What we need are African leaders who understand that there's more to be gained by coming together than that which is lost. This speaker was also very interesting because he drew from some of the traditional African saying, there was a time I was reading a book by Noviolet Bulawayo. It's, uh, we're going to need new names. It's a fantastic book. Let me just plug an African writer right now. If you would like to read it, please go and read it. It's a very um, intricate story about um, the colonial history and how it impacted uh, Zimbabwe and how just you know the naming of the people the culture and how people revolted against colonial rule in Zimbabwe totally fictional but most of the time fiction is drawn from what is surrounded by us and you know she says in her book Umuntu no Umuntu Ngabantu it's a South African adage that says somebody a person is a person because of people and Unfortunately for Africa, again, because of the borders and the segregation, we live, oh, I'm South African, I'm Kenyan, I'm Malawian, I'm Ugandan, I'm Ghanaian. And at the core, we forget that we're just Africans. When you get out of the continent, nobody cares what country you're from or how developed it is. We are all seen as this one people from a dark continent that suffers from diseases, poverty, war, uh, and hunger, you know. And so he was like, Africans really need to come together and start tapping into their power as Africans. We need to start coming together, supporting each other. We need to believe in ourselves, in the quality of the products that we produce. We need to believe in that brotherhood we need to be our brother's keeper we need to go all out for each other um before uh the colonialists came and drew the borders and segregated the continent we were just like technically one people so africans need to start tapping into their africanness and that ubuntu spirit of togetherness and oneness in the continent is to grow and move forward before we engage china before we engage the russians before we engage the americans we will say we want a space program what do we know about space is africans what are our views about space what are our values what does ubuntu say what is our knowledge system, our indigenous knowledge system? When you are proactive, when you start with thyself, know thyself, you'll be able to address that matter and actually leverage your own wisdom. Our problem is that we don't start with ourselves. We start with China. We start with India. We start with America and Europe. We never say, I'm an African. What is my belief system? I'm an African. What do I know about space? I'm an African. What are my views about space? What is the history in my continent in terms of understanding space? So very important point you are raising. And in my framework, we'll solve it because we'll start with ourselves, our history, our culture, our... You know, as Africans, sometimes we undervalue ourselves. We think we can learn from Singapore, from Malaysia, from China. We can also learn from ourselves. Ubuntu. I am because we are. We are because I am. A person is a person because of other people. They don't have it in China. They don't have it in America. Not in Japan, but we have it. Collective success is more important than individual success. The spirit of togetherness and just tapping into our power cannot also work if we do not move in one accord and do business from that from that standpoint. I've seen that there's certain African countries that when you want to do business as a block, they will create issues. 
For example, right now we have the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And to your surprise, this should be one of the biggest and best things that has ever happened to African countries where we say we are one economic block. We are going to do away with barriers and borders so that people and goods can move freely. But you'll find some countries are still being very stingy with their markets. And it baffles you because how do you think as one country you're going to survive? You have to come together as a block, do business, speak in one accord. It's the same thing that President Ruto was talking about. Um, and he was like, if you want to do business with Africa, don't come and do business with one African country. You need to do business with Africa as a block. That ensures that our brothers and sisters across the continent get a fair deal, you know. And also business should be aligned to the greater good of the continent because sometimes we do some of these deals and they, they literally don't make sense. I was listening to South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, during their visit to France to discuss a new global monetary framework with President Macron. And he said, if you want to work with us, do a railway from Cairo to Cape Town. And this is the kind of infrastructure that are African in nature, because that means that people and goods will have a direct route and access all the way from Cairo to Cape Town and vice versa. So whatever you're doing, it has to be for the greater good of the continent. Remember the borders, artificial borders. Do you know there are more Swazi people in South Africa than in Swaziland? Is it Iswati? What's it called? The new name now? There are more Swanas in South Africa than in Botswana. So these borders are meaningless. Why Swaziland is what? Why Botswana? Yes, there is a problem, but also the borders are artificial. We can manage our cultural differences. We can work together. You know, it's not impossible. The Germans and the French fought two wars. The French hate the Germans. The British don't like the Germans, but they're in the EU together although the British is running away. But, but what I'm saying is don't overemphasize these cultural differences. Others have been able to manage them. And our borders are not out of our choice anyway. They were created by the Berlin Conference in 1884. So yes, there are challenges around cultural differences. They are not impossible. They can be managed and mitigated. Currency exchanges. There's always a benefit in terms of economies of scale. If we had a pan-African currency, one currency, surely we'd be able to extract better value if we are doing the deal with the RMB or the Chinese currency, as opposed to Nigeria doing it, Rwanda, Zimbabwe. So numbers make a difference. One of the major lessons from China is a lot of people 1.3 billion Chinese working together, economies of scale. So whatever it is, there's always a benefit in terms of economies of scale. Look, when I emphasize that we don't want bilateral deals, I'm overstating my case. What I'm simply saying is that if there's going to be a bilateral deal between South Africa and China, it must be within the context of the African agenda. We're doing this in South Africa in keeping with Agenda 2063. We're doing this as Algeria because of that decision at the AU. We're doing this thing as Zimbabwe because that's what Comesa is about. That's what the Sadak position is. In other words, when we relate bilaterally, it must be informed by what is good for the region, what is good for the continent. The continent must be the starting point. Well, thank you very much for watching. That's all I had for you in this episode. I'll catch you again next time. Let me know what you think about the spirit of Ubuntu and just the fact that now Africans are beginning to believe that borders are unnecessary and are meaningless. I'll see you again next time.